So I'm Stephen Crawford. I'm the district director for the Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation here in the district office of Maricopa Community Colleges. Um, and I am, uh, I love AI. I have been using this quite a bit. I am, I have been using this to write some of my talks, in fact. Um, I have one tomorrow more, tomorrow afternoon I'm giving uh, where I had it write the introduction for me and then I did the editing. But uh, one of the things we'll talk about later is I'm one of the uh, refugees from the uh, second AI winter, which because I was when I was doing my uh, my bachelor's degree in the early 90s, it was to be a, an AI. And then all the funding dried up and all the programs died. And so that's what they refer to as the AI winter is when there, there was no funding from anywhere. So. I would have been, an, I probably would have been an AI programmer right now if it wasn't for the fact that um, that went away. So instead, I got into educational technology and been using Packback, which is an AI based tool here in the district for three years, and uh, and I've worked with them quite a bit. So there's some really cool things going on the on the education side. I was also on the uh, Horizon Report panel for the previous two years, not this one coming up, but the last two. So cool. kind of involved cool. in those trends. And he's also um, on my committee for my dissertation. So that's why I'm, I'm really happy to have him here. Um, okay, let's see. So today, you know, we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, everybody kind of keeps an open mind. I heard this morning, um, it was actually last night's Lester Holt um, news story and it was frightening. But we're going to try not to go to the frightening place yet. We're just going to stay with like an open mind, raise some issues, talk about some discussion. Um, and like any new technology, it's a double-edged sword and you might feel yourself pulled in one way or another. Um, but let's just try to keep this, you know, like not, not like the news. How's that? So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Stephen. Stephen, just let me know when you want me to move through the slides. And he can kind of give you an idea of what um, GI is, give us a little history about it, some of the apps that are out there, how it works, how it was trained, et cetera. So hand it over to you. Yeah. So this has been a real interesting year of 2022. Uh, I will tell you that I thought chat, chat GPT was not the most interesting thing to happen in the AI world last year. Um, generative AI has been evolving quite a bit and, uh, and, and really it made a bigger splash in my opinion, in the AI circles and kind of should have been the warning bell of what was coming next back in the spring of 2022, when DALI, uh, two, which is a system for generating images from text to images and also stable diffusion and some of these others, um, that is kind of what we're talking about here when we talk about generative AI, artificial intelligence is taking something and creating something new from it. Uh, it's that transformer piece that's really interesting because it, it really helps think about things in new ways. And so actually, I'm going to talk about G, uh, GI a little bit here for a moment. So that's where I, I think it's really interesting is that, and, and I'll talk about some of this, this kind of also sets the stage for some of the frightening things that you have heard about in the media, New York Times that everybody is freaking out about. Essentially, it's taking very large data sets, and that's it's a large language model is the other as other phrase you'll hear often, and that is the data set. Essentially, you know, the more data you have, the idea is that the more ideas and things it can generate. Um, we'll talk about how that can be interesting. Um, and that's just it. it's creating new things. Like I said, the in October, uh, October, sorry, in the summer, we had in Colorado uh, 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 an individual who won the state fair art contest by using an AI generator. Um, and and so that's been a very interesting piece. It's using things to make up patterns. You've heard, in, maybe you've heard in uh, in some of the headlines about how it's fixing things. Fix, it's detecting cancer, for an example. So. Um, it, it can look, it gets, if it's been trained and knows that all these types of photographs is cancer and they, and then all these other photographs aren't cancer, skin cancer specifically to use a single example, then you can feed it an image of, of, uh, of, of skin and it can make a diagnosis that is sometimes a little bit more predictive than a human doctor. Um, 
and saying, oh, there, there might be something here that a human doctor may have overlooked. So it's about generating those new things and, and such. So on the next slide, we'll give a quick history of how we got here. So uh, this all started in the 50s. And, and, and it, you know, we, we hear of Alan Turing. There's been a couple of references over the last nine months specifically about the Turing test. Uh, I say that because uh, the predecessor to Google's Bard that just came out, their version of ChatGPT, one of their scientists was data scientists was fired because uh, he tried to convince everybody that it was it was alive and sentient. And um, really funny, interesting article in Wired magazine and how we're not there yet. Um, and there actually are tests for for that. And the Turing test is one of them. The idea behind the Turing test is if you could feed uh, if you could feed information to a machine and it can provide a response back that uh, you could not tell was machine generated, then therefore it passes the Turing test and it's it's you know it's 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 whatever it's artificial intelligence it's an intelligent piece, and that's kind of the idea is that if you can't tell that, but here was a problem in the fifties we had all these great things going on we were doing symbolic processing. Uh, which is great for solving calculus problems, uh, not so much for generating new ideas. And so, but they also believed, oh, we're a generation away from true general artificial intelligence. We are not yet even near general artificial intelligence yet. We're just doing generative. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. In the 80s, you started seeing some of these tools emerge again. Uh, this is where you started to see the rise of your um, call systems. You know, a lot of these, you know, these automated chatbots started to come out in the 80s, especially the chatbots themselves. They couldn't do the speech part, but they could do the chat part online. And we started seeing those emerge. Uh, and then in 91, in the 90s, you know, again, Mathematica is where we start to see things like uh, for solving calculus problems. You know, uh, there was that essentially that, you know, when people talk about graphing, this being chat GPT being like changing the world, like a graphing calculator did. Keep in mind, there's AI that some people have adopted and, and a lot have not because there's a price tag attached to it. And Mathematica can get a little expensive. 2000s is where we started seeing a little bit more things where you get those voice uh, chatbots where you, you can say something and it'll give you the menu options as opposed to punching numbers. Again, it's still very rule-based is the problem. AI behind the cars. You know, we started off with the very first year of... Uh, the self-driving cars and the big DARPA challenge. And it's like, oh, the winner made it like nine miles on the hundred and some odd mile course. But the next year, everybody got smarter and, and working on that. And so that's a lot of where we're seeing how this came about. We also saw, the you know, we saw AI start to become more to this generative side. So yes, it, it was beating grandmasters in chess. Finally did that. It was beating Ken Jennings in Jeopardy. But the real impressive one was the Go Championship. Uh, the first one, the AI beat from, I think it was the Google AI, that they were, one of the AIs they were developing, beat, won and beat the world champion in the board game Go. It's super complex, it's super like millions of possibilities beyond chess. And, and it won, it's like, okay, it won, it did a good job. The next year, the champion said it was playing like a god. It was doing moves that no one had ever done before because it wasn't being held back by the conventions of the game. It was like, oh, well, these are legal moves. Let's make them. And, and no human had, were doing some of those moves. So that's where we started to turn a point. One other piece I will drop in real fast is last year is also when we had uh, the White House issue ethical AI guidance. And one of my favorites is the human should always be in control. And I think that's where we should start making sure our conversations is we're using AI. The human should always be in control. All right. So now let's look at some of the things. And I've already hit on some of the AI driven uh, things we've seen. We've seen the intelligent tutor systems, um, some educational games. We've seen a lot of these start to pop up uh, in the 90s as teaching tools for students. We started getting that speech recognition uh, that was when you're, uh, you know, people started to started to play with, hey, could we do closed captionings without humans? Can we just have it all recognized and work? Uh, two thousands, you know, you started when you started having these large data sets, thanks to Amazon, Netflix, predicting what you should watch next on TV or what should you buy next. Uh, we had people at ASU in the uh, in the mid to late aughts who were like, how do we use AI? 
to tell which student they should tell students which class they should take based off of both their major map and their learning preferences. It's like, no, you should take this class, not not take, you know, class, you know, ABC 202, but take ABC 202 at this day and time because you'd seem to perform better at those times. Again, virtual learning environment. So we're seeing a lot of this come in and then also adaptive learning. The idea about adaptive learning is, is that you're beginning to get an AI who's doing it. Now, again, a lot of this is stuck on the symbolic side of AI, where it's a lot of rule-based and thinking about how do I interpret certain rules and, and move towards it. But with generative, we're now beginning to move beyond the human restrictions. And that can be a little problematic, um, as we'll talk about um, here in a few in a moment here. So... So for those, uh, we look at the next slide here, talking about chat GPT itself is that it's free to use, kinda. If you have, if you wanna use the current 3.5, you have to, it's free. And you just have to hope the server's not busy. If you pay a little money, not only can you get priority access to the 3.5, you can get early access to their 4.0 beta, which is supposed to be far better. And there's some big implications about that that um, some of you guys, I think, are going to really, really like. Um, the way the thing to think about it is, it's really just an a, a, a auto text generator when you get down to it using probability. For those of you who have an iPhone uh, and you send messages, you see that you open up the keyboard and uh, and you'll see the text of the possible words you could click on. And, and when you see those words, sometimes they're the word you're looking for. So for an example, if I was to give you the phrase, put, and go ahead and put this in the chat. Tell me what you think the next word is to this sentence. Superheroes don't always wear. And what do you put in the chat? So I got some pants, capes, tights, and I have had, and I have had women go high heels because they're superheroes too. Um, and that's just it. Statistically, the next word is capes. And that's what it's doing. It's looking at the text you've written or the text it's written and go, what is the next word in the sequence? And that, what is statistically the next word in the sequence? And that's one of the reasons why when you see it generate citations. It's not generating real citations. And a lot of those citations are by Tom Smith. <laughs> and, and that's because those are very common names. So that is the thing to think about um, on how does it work is that it is essentially trying to um, help you know, think about that. And that's how you're finding that watermark. So for anybody who uses Gmail, you're seeing the exact same thing. You're typing your email and you'll start to see words in gray pop up and you can click and, and accept those words. If you accept them, then essentially what you're saying is, I am accepting the statistically likely next words of my sentence. And that's what ChatGPT do, is doing, is going, asking a question. It's generating some, it's generating a couple of things, you know, it has, and then it builds off that prompt. And using its super super search for lack of a better term, which is why Google's freaking out right now. And and then it's writing however you write. It's you know, if you tell it to write like an eighth grader, it'll write like an eighth grader. You tell it write if you say, Hey, here is my problem in my apartment, write a legal par write a paragraph in legal lease, it'll do that. It'll write. In fact, there are stories where, where people have had emails where they send them to their landlord, the landlord ignores them. And then they run the same email through chat GPT and have it translated to legalese. And all those legal words scare the crap out of the landlord. Next thing you know, the problem's getting solved. Um, and so we have seen stories like that. And so that, and we've seen for the last 15 years, sports stories, where it'll look at box scores and stats from a sporting event and write a sports story. Odds are you've read them. ESPN, Sports Illustrated, all of them are doing that. And so, uh, especially for second tier schools and sports. So it's probably doing it, I hate to say it, for NAU athletics. It's doing it for ASU volleyball because 
How many people watch volleyball? It's, if there's a low audience, it's just going to do a, a, a simple AI, AI story. It's probably doing it for all the community college sports, unless it's a major event. So when we look about how is it trained, how we how do we get those next statistically likely words? So again, huge amounts of data, and that's that's really what it comes down to, is the more data you have, the more you can kind of dial in your prediction. Now we've done this before, and and we have failed miserably. 2016, Microsoft had an incident with a chatbot they put on um, on Twitter. There's probably the first mistake and people would interact with her. And, um, and so she was trained on all of the data available on Twitter. Even in 2016, you know, that's probably not a lot of good stuff there. There's probably a lot of bad things there. Uh, we have a new word for that. And I'll talk about that word in a minute. It didn't take her long for the engineers to pull her down. I, I it, it was like, it may, it might have been online for hours, but it may have also been online for only twenty minutes before she started praising Hitler and talking about how great racism is, uh, because again, the data set is the data set, and that's why Chat GPT three five has been so successful, and that's why Microsoft's Beam GPT was not and had some scary headlines. So, what they did with uh, Chat GPT three five is they they took a page from the social media book. When you have uh, an inappropriate, if somebody flags a post on Facebook uh, or any other social media platforms that still care about that, it's flagged as, as, as inappropriate. Someone goes and reviews it. That someone is not paid a lot and there's a lot of bad things they have to watch. So there's a mental health question we have to ask here. Um, and one of those companies is based out of Kenya. And that company is the one that scoured the data for inappropriate content. And that's one of the reasons why chat GPT 3.5 does not go into some of the, let's see if I get the phrasing right, the darker corners of human writing on the internet, which I think is one of my favorite phrases right now. In other words, the racist, sexist, and all the other stuff that we don't like. Um, and that is how that, the problem is when Microsoft did theirs, they, they used the exact same code, probably the exact same training model. The only difference is they had all the data and there was a lot more dark corners available for their AI to train on. And that's why it became problematic and, and semi gaslighting. And that's just it is that, that that's, that's the thing about the AI is that even the programmers sometimes do not know why it hallucinates, which is why, and the word hallucinate, by the way, means uh, gives a, makes mistakes or, or errors or makes errors. I love that new word too. And, and, and that's just it is that as we don't even know half the time, we talk about, we, we got to learn to trust the algorithms and we also got to question the algorithm at the same time, because we've seen court algorithms and AI go awry because they were so rule-based that essentially they were repeating some of the red line errors of the banking laws from the sixties in Detroit. So now we're doing the same thing with courts and, and sentencing. Um, and therefore we, we used essentially, you know, by using zip codes, you're almost using, you know, you can't use race, but we can use zip code and zip code problematic. So, um, that's where we get with us being less rule based. We don't know sometimes why the AI is making the decisions it's making. The programmers aren't able to explain it because they've, they only understand the framework that it's built on the AI how you feed the data to it and, and how you emphasize things is extremely important. And that's one of the things to be mindful of. And that's why when we talk about the AI, there is no the AI. There's Google Bard, there's Bing GPT, there's GPT-3.5 at OpenAI and GPT-4 at OpenAI. And China's got their own that's on the rise now as well. So there's a number of different ones and they're all written and trained differently with different data sets. And that becomes a huge question mark is because who's flagging the information as appropriate or not. And so that, that, and that's, that's something that when you think about is very important to think about. So to hit the, some of the facts about uh, chat GPT on the next slide, you know, we'll see hallucinations. We talked about that briefly. Um, another thing that we're seeing, and I love this phrase, 
prompt engineering. Um, so one of the things I, and I love this, I, I think of prompt engineering as learning how to ask better questions. So for an example, I've been using uh, stable diffusion for my clip art and I, I don't, I don't use clip art sites anymore. And, and I was using Dali too, and I was having miserable results until I learned how to ask better questions and make better statements to the AI. Um, we've seen, it, this is, by the way, everyone's talking about how democratizing this is. It is banned in other countries. I, I have a colleague in Egypt who is an educator. She tried to use chat GPT. It wouldn't let her because she was in Egypt. So she fought it for VPN. It still wouldn't let her because it required a phone number and hers was not in the correct country. So she had to borrow a friend's phone number <laughs> in a different country to use it. And then because she, uh, she te her teaching area, she asked for a feminist possession, uh, uh, a feminist perspective of, of a certain Islamic teaching and it refused to give it to her. And that's one of the things you're seeing is there are certain topics that won't go to, but people are beginning to learn how to ask the question differently to force it to talk about it. And it's, it's been, it's been interesting. We've seen some of the, uh, the panic reactions such as New York city public schools, uh, just going, nope, we're going to put, we're going to block it at the firewall. Can't use it. If you have any device on our network, it will not talk to chat GPT. And that's great because I'm still using it on my phone because I'm not on your network. Uh, and we're seeing a number of places having those conversations and thinking, you know, even I think Virginia, the governor of Virginia was talking about, do we need a statewide ban from education systems? And it's like, I, I have a hard time with that. And one of the reasons why I, I'll talk about that in, in a moment, but I, I have a hard time with the bans. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing a lot. And we saw a lot of those, everybody's cheating conversations and everybody's been cheating all along. And, and, you know, and when it comes to cheating, what I've seen typically, in fact, there's some good research on this topic. The students who cheat in your class are the ones who essentially have no connection to you or your content. Um, and they're the cheaters most often. And that's that's what we've seen in research. And it doesn't matter what modality it's in. Um, and so that's one of the things to keep in mind when it comes to that. Yeah, it just may. And we've we've had people get their dissertations by having someone else write it for them for years. I mean, there are paper mills. Go through the Chronicle of Higher Education. Every couple of years, they interview somebody who used to work at a paper mill, and, and they talk about all the papers they've written that supposedly have gotten people master's and doctorate's degrees. One person would be writing all these. So, so yeah, there, there, there's some issues. So let's talk about the uh, embrace or not to embrace here for a quick moment, and then I'm going to hand it back over to, uh, to Linda. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, you know, why I'm not scared of Jet GPT. A couple articles, we've seen this in the Chronicle. Um, I, I'm going to throw out one that I've been reading the, over the last week. There is a, a, a paper that has come out of um, out of MIT. It's a working paper at the moment. It's very early results, 444 college educated individuals. And, and what's interesting, they did a treatment and a, uh, and, and a control group for this study. Their, their, their preliminary data is showing that it reduces the brainstorming time of the writing process. It reduces the writing time of the process, but it increases the editing time of the writing process. And when you add the three together, it's still faster. And you go, well, if it's shorting the, the, create, the, the brainstorming time, how, how, what's the quality? Well, they compared the quality and essentially the quality went up even though they were doing less time on, on the brainstorming side. And what was more important is the, the individuals who were rated as having lower writing ability were now writing with chat GPT at a level almost of those as the high writing ability individuals. So you almost, you could tell a small difference, but there wasn't much difference between the two. Essentially, the, they're, they're making the argument that chat GPT in the workplace could open up new occupations for our some of our students and for some of our, our graduates whose writing abilities aren't that great, but their thinking abilities are fantastic. And now they can now compete with those with high writing skills and can maybe move into occupations that were close to them previously. Uh, again, I think we have to be super careful. We cannot trust anything that it says. Um, it's like it's like verify it. I feel the same thing about Wikipedia. I feel the same thing about Google. Heck, look at the number of research studies that get retracted. You can't go off of a single source. And I think that's one of the key things that I look at. 
I've also been embracing it for, like I said, for clip art, I use stable diffusion. One of the things about chat GPT four that I'm super excited about is that we are now approaching a position for accessibility of some of our online courses in a new way. Um, one of the biggest, so back in the day, everybody would complain about having to do captions for their videos. Um, because, and back in the day, the AI wasn't that great. I mean, it was good, but you had to edit that work. And now it's getting really, really good. It's almost all, not quite, but almost to the point where I trust it. Where chat GPT-4, I feel like we're at that same point as we were five, 10 years ago with images. Because very few of us have a, a good long description or even a uh, description for images for students who have visual impairments. So if we can drop an image into chat GPT-4, which you can, and get text back, that gives you a description that you can now edit. And, and, and instead of having to try to write something out that's either too brief or, or you know, you can now have something a little bit more verbose potentially and have a good image. So I, I see a lot of good things on the accessibility side. Um, we, we're seeing this getting integrated into more and more tools. It's been announced. It's going to, A, it's supposed to be a Microsoft 11 taskbar already, uh, the Bing GPT. I see it's coming to Microsoft Word soon. Um, yes, I know for those who do coding, it's writing code far better than a lot of humans. And it's also finding errors in human code. So it's it's a really interesting time. Um, so yeah, I think there's some really great opportunities that we have uh, in front of us. And I just threw a couple out there. Linda, anything else you want to hit on or is that a good place to stop? Yeah, we'll, but, we'll stop there and we'll return back to GPT-4 at the end um, because that's the new version that just was just released. Um, the, the next topic we're going to talk about is just the challenges and, and benefits, but we're going to do it through scenarios. So um, I've created this Google Doc, and I'm going to share it with you guys in the, um, uh, if I can do it, copy link, um, share it with you in the chat area so you can access it. And then I'm going to open up the um, breakout rooms. And if you guys want to choose a breakout room to go into, and there'll be, you'll, you'll see this whole document, which will have, you know, a, a, a scenario with some benefits and challenges. And if you guys could just read through the scenario and then write down your benefits and challenges, make sure you have a note taker and someone who's ready to present the results. Um, and hopefully we get uh, you know, I, I think I got rid of one or two. I got five and there are six up here. But if you feel like you want to jump into another scenario, go for it. I'm going to give you like seven minutes um, to tackle this. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the rooms. And I'm hoping you guys, can you all see the join button for the joining your breakout rooms? Go ahead and join a breakout room and um, and have at it. So I just wanted to mention that I have had a little bit of experience with ChatGPT, just just a very short amount, um, and I have found my experience with it was uh, surprising, pleasantly surprising. Uh, however, uh, I, I think Stephen, you mentioned the, that it was writing code better than other people, but I have seen examples where it hasn't. It's 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 writing. Um, uh, it's writing code that works, but typically, and from an educational standpoint, you know, you, we teach that you need to write code that's legible as well. And uh, the response that was returned from ChatGPT wasn't necessarily a legible response that another programmer would be able to go, oh, I see what's and, going on here. And as an old computer science guy, that's a great distinction because yeah. it, is, it may be writing more efficient code, but it may not be writing readable code. <laughs> Well, yeah. and, I, and I also did see the new GPT-4 coding capabilities. And the thing that I thought was amazing was like, you could have it write the code. And then if you got an error message, you you could put the error message into GPT-4 and it would fix the code. And like all that troubleshooting, like the hours and hours of troubleshooting of getting that code right. I mean, yeah, I just like, oh, I wish I had it, but it, <laughs> point though and it probably didn't have a lot of documentation and stuff like that in there um yeah any other benefits or challenges that you guys want to share 
I, I did see it as a, a good way to augment or maybe change up uh, another le learning lesson. Like if you they're hearing it from me, plus they're putting it into chat GPT and it gives a response and an explanation for everything that it's done. So that is another good thing if if the student reads it. If they just go in there and copy and paste, then still have not very much use. <laughs> So do you want me to go? Sure. You were probably going to call on me anyways, right? So, um, so we Ashley and I were looking at uh, scenario five, which was a science-based, biology-based, and so really, some of the benefits. Um, it really comes down to if we were to incorporate this in sort of a research project, is that idea of having students learn how to ask better questions, right? Because and that's really is is how we're using G, Chat GPT or whatever source we're using uh, to kind of take them down that path to get to where they want to go. And so from a learning how to question perspective, it's it's very, very helpful. The thing we we came back to, though, is that on the other side of that, um, now I'll come back to another benefit, but a, a challenge is that, remember, this is a, a language-based model. It's not a fact-based model. And so the factual information may not be completely accurate. And so while it does pull, like it, you can, it'll provide references and things like that, you know, part of this process, it's really, if you're going to use it in a classroom like this, it's kind of a two-phase process. The first one is, okay, let's ask questions, but then based on the answers you have, the second part is, okay, now let's validate what you found to make sure that it's actual, actually true. And so whether that's going out to other sources, you know, PubMed, pulling up research articles, verifying either the citations that were given or finding additional corroborating types of papers as well. So that's that's kind of the flip side is that it can be really, really great in a lot of ways is getting them thinking, but then also getting them thinking about, okay, what is true, what isn't true. Ashley, did I forget anything? No, I think that was great. Although um, you did bring up another really good point, which is sort of the um, the cutoff of the data that you know is really being pulled from. And so, if uh, you brought up like maybe immunology or something that's really fast paced um, in terms of a field and the research that's coming through and the things that would be relevant to students for a research project, um, something like that might not be as well suited because the data that the um, intelligence is pulling from isn't going to be that up to date. Well, and you know, you're reminding me of like some of the, I'll have my students go into their textbooks and I'll say, okay, let's go to the news articles and let's find news articles and let's see how, what, what, if you wrote a letter to the editor, what, how would you tell them to change this based on the evidence? Because I, I teach yeah. a field that moves quickly too and same thing, but good points. Yeah, I mean, I grew up where the history book stopped with the uh, moon landing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm old, but not that old. Um, but, you know, to, to hit on your point a little further, one of the stories that made the the popular press was um, when Chad GPT tried to gaslight someone about the Super Bowl winner because it doesn't know about the 2022 or tw actually knew about the 22 Super Bowl, but it didn't know about the 23 one. Um, and it's like, oh no, it was not played in Arizona. It was played in 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 California, and and yeah, that that because it didn't know because it's not in this data set. Hey, you quiet ones. So our group talked about scenario three, which is the one about generating essay prompts, um, where. Uh, the instructor has the tool generate a range of essay prompts for students to choose from, and then the students can pick one of those and use the tool as a reference guide to develop their ideas. So we thought that this would be engaging for students, um, that it would be especially helpful for people who struggle to find a topic. Um, knowing what you know, open topic English papers can be like, that can be really hard for people. Um, another benefit would be that the students would know that the instructor has engaged with um, chat GPT and is familiar with how it works and what the results look like. So a possible deterrent for, uh, to students using it uh, to turn papers unedited. And then um, saving time and allowing students to work more on the later parts of the writing process and not that initial step that, that bogs them down. And I think the only challenge we got to was 
how to deal with the temptation for students to go too far with it. I think that's really interesting how uh, you bring up the even just sort of presenting the concept of this um, so that the students don't think you don't know about it. Uh, I think that's pretty brilliant. And a lot of other deterrents I've heard about kind of are just that simple, like, you know, having a conversation about it and hopefully not having to do much more than that. Okay, well, you know, these, uh, I'll be honest here. So all those scenarios were created by ChatGPT. I did not create those on my own. Um, I gave it some parameters and um, it was, I love scenarios. I, I love them in my multiple choice questions um, and they're a wonderful tool for me. Um, so there's that, but um, you know, in the next section next week, we're going to really dive a, a lot deeper into using it in the classroom and these ideas about digital literacy and how important it is um, that we communicate uh, why we need to be honest with our work um, and and really not just once, not in the syllabus, um, in, or not just in the syllabus, but throughout the whole course. And it, it has to be like a message. We kind of have to create this like culture that surrounds it. So we'll go into that a little bit more deeply, but I think Stephen wanted to share um, some tools with you guys that he's yeah. been involved with before we let you go. So again, this, uh, this is through some of the work I've done with Packback and I'm putting the link here in the chat. Uh, NAU, I know, just adopted this tool. And full disclosure, I, uh, I'm i in the white paper on how academia is adapting to generative AI. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share that with you is I'm one of three higher education folks who they interviewed. Um, and you can get some really great perspectives of how people are thinking about it. Uh, the first link on the page is actually Teach with GPT. And, and there are four tools on here. And the first one is everyone's favorite check gpt and it's their version of a free tool all you gotta do is give them your name and email address uh but it's a it's a free tool you can use to kind of check to see if someone's using a, a gpt model again it's not going to be 100 percent because it's trying to use that statistical model and some people may literally be writing statistically the next word every single time uh, some may not be, um, but you know, that's, that's kind of, some may be changing up the words that they get. If they're editing it, that's, that's going to kind of make it harder to catch not for me that check GPT. Yeah. yeah. Now for me, the second one is the more fun one. And that's the fact check the AI assignment generator. And this is one where I think this hits on that critical thinking side of our students. Um, we should not trust. I mean, we, we, we talk about disinformation. And I think this is a great way to kind of deal with that problem without dealing with that problem directly by name. And so if we can generate an essay with factual errors on any content that's related to your course, and then ask the students to find the errors, this is a great way to do that. And there's a direct link to the, uh, to the labs itself. Uh, yeah, because it's, uh, so these are some tools and there's a couple more in here that are, that are a lot of fun to work with. But these are free tools that you can use to start using chat GPT in your teaching without changing what you're doing. And I think that's a nice first step to kind of get familiar going, okay, what's going on here? And look at, I like the fact check one. That's my favorite. Okay. So I should just also frame um, for those of you who came in a little late and who might not have read all the way through my email, but um, uh Anna Hammerly is, I think, going to be um, organizing a faculty forum about this, um, and it's coming down from the Faculty Senate. Um, and so we were thinking that we would do these two sessions before that forum, so that forum could be a little more productive to talk about, like, what are some of the next steps that the college needs to take? You know, how can we write an, uh, an informed syllabus statement? Um, do we need to update 
our academic integrity quiz and maybe some of the policies and procedures um, around that. And, you know, how do we want to approach this as a school? And so that's why we're kind of just giving like some foundational knowledge, kind of having some conversation about it. And then um, hopefully when, when the faculty forum gets together, they can really um, delve into their um, challenges that they anticipate and, and benefits and how can they embrace it. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And um, does anybody have any burning questions? Have you heard a scary story you want to hear debunked? No. I'll just ask that question. I'll go there. So the the, the thing we also should share for those of you who, ha who haven't heard, ChatGPT is no longer the latest release. Um, we now have GPT-4, which just came out, I think, a week and a half ago, and where ChatGPT got like 10% or er, er, scored in the 10th percentile on the MCATs, GPT-4 scored in the 90th percentile on the MCATs. Um, it also can do this, this thing he was, uh, Stephen was talking about, about the, being able to read images. Um, and some of the things that I think are really cool and that I'm talking about with some of my students at Foothill is its ability to, um, it, well, it's, it's, the, the government of Iceland is actually putting together a, a language revitalization program and they're training artificial intelligence to um, learn indigenous Icelandic language. And, and so they're able to preserve their language, which is, you know, it's really hard for linguists to write it all down. But if, if everybody can crowdsource and get, um, their language in the system. It's a fantastic thing. There's other things where there's a program, I would, would it's like um, for visually impaired folks where it can help you identify products because now that it's got this image recognition, like if you go to the grocery store and you want to like know like what kind of soup you want to get, it'll tell you, you know, what you're looking at. Um, so a lot of things are coming out in accessibility. And, and so this is not like, the ball has just begun to roll and the snow snowman or snowball is going to get bigger as we go. But thank you guys and have a wonderful Thursday evening. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you Stephen. Thank Linda. you. Good to see you all.